Hey everyone, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study, and we are looking at an End Times 101, Eschatology 101, however you want to word that. Um, we've been looking at the last three and a half years of the tribulation just before Jesus returns, and we've considered, you know, Jacob's trouble, the Antichrist wars with the saints, we've considered Israel's flight through the nations. Now I want to narrow in on this little detail that's come up a couple times so far, the strength and power of Israel broken. So it was required of the high priest to offer a sacrifice for himself first, and then he could offer sacrifices on behalf of the people uh, on the Day of Atonement. You find this in Leviticus 9, 7, as well as 16, 11, and 15. Um, so too must the priestly nation have atonement made on her behalf before she herald the priestly duties on behalf of the other nations. So what I want to say here is that the issue of the strength and power of Israel broken is not a matter of God being facetious to them. It's not a matter of God trying to like just belabor the point is that they're a stiff-necked people and they need their power broken. But there's a, there's a way in which God works. This act is not about atonement alone, but displays that the priest is altogether identified with the people. And so, and I guess, I guess with that statement, maybe, maybe that's where I should say, the strength and power of Israel broken. It's not a matter of God needs to break their pride because they're just a stiff-necked and prideful people since the time they came out of Egypt. God has always said this of them. It's that in order for Israel to be the priestly people and identifying with the nations, they have to recognize and realize their own hearts. And they have to recognize and realize the own pride and the issues that God had to deal with them as a people, not just simply as an individual, but as a people, if they are to go then to other peoples, other nations, and to speak to those peoples as peoples. You see in Daniel 12:7. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. Leviticus 26, 19. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. 2 Corinthians 3, 13 and 14. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away, but... Their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. Deuteronomy 32, 21, and 36. I will make them jealous by those who are no people. I will make them angry by a nation that has no understanding. The Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees their strength is gone and no one is left slave or free. Israel will even corporately confess in the course of my life, he broke my strength. Isaiah 2, 17 and 18. The arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day and the idols will totally disappear. What must happen for this to take place? And this is really where the rubber meets the road. I can put the scriptures together, but if the question is just a matter of how do the scriptures come together, we're going to miss it. Because the question should always be the heart of God. What is it that God is getting at? And beyond what is it that God is getting at, what is, what is his purposes? Or what are his purposes? You know? so, so I guess that's what I'm getting at here, that second question. What must happen for this to take place? What are, what are God's purposes? What's it, what is the intention? What is it that God does leading up to this? Deuteronomy 28 is one of the most encouraging and discouraging chapters in the Bible. There's a progression in the curses. It's encouraging because it says, if you, if you obey my law, these are the things that are going to come. And because there's a, a progression in the curses, it doesn't just start all outright with, if you disobey me, I'm going to give you over to your enemies. There's a progression. God says, look, if you disobey me, I'm going to do this. And if you still don't see it, if that sign's not enough, I'm going to do a greater sign. If that sign's not enough, I'll do still greater signs. I will put signposts up so that you can see them. And it, you, you can come to your senses and ask the question of, why are we still going down this way? Isn't it obvious? Shouldn't we have seen it long ago? It should never get to the point of exile. Many red flags should be raised to ask why the blessings are not manifested. And not just why the blessings aren't manifested, but why are the curses present? Why are we being cursed? 
Yet even to this day, even to this day, even today, modern times, Jews do not ask the why question, except in a minor way, unwilling to hear judgment. I've never heard of a Jew asking the question of why am I born in New York City or Chicago or Charlotte or wherever. There's never the why are we in exile. It's just kind of a way of life. Isaiah 2.22, stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils. Of what account is he? Ezekiel 7.24, I will bring the most wicked of the nations to take possession of the house. I will put an end to the pride of the mighty. God is after the heart of Israel, that heart that has not been circumcised and tenderized before the Lord. There's something that God is looking at. He's not just simply saying these things. Again, it's not just simply to say, you're too prideful. You've got too much strength in yourself. You're trusting in the arm of the flesh. And just kind of that, stop doing that. No, God's after something. He wants, he wants a different way of viewing. He wants them to recognize what he's seeing, and in recognizing that, also then recognize the alternative and to realize they've messed up. Just like you and I have that same opportunity to realize in our own lives the strength by which we are exerting ourselves. Is it our natural strength or is it like Paul saying that he works and he writes in all of the strength of Jesus? I mean, you just read Colossians and you come to the verse where he says, in all of his strength, not my strength. And have we come to that point? Or are we continuing Sunday after Sunday to preach sermons or to give testimony or to have Bible studies or to do whatever? Just week after week after week, put up YouTube videos. I mean, whatever it would be. Are we still working in our own strength and calling it of the Lord because we're teaching something about God, but we don't realize that even in the midst of teaching about God, we ourselves are the Moses who have put the veil on because we're not allowing it to be by God's strength, trusting in man rather than in God, and therefore we are blinding our people. Psalm 88, 13 through 18, But I cry to you for help, O Lord, in the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my mouth I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones. You've taken them from me. The darkness is my closest friend. From my youth, I have been afflicted and close to death. I mean, this is a testimony that ought to cut us to the quick. It reminds me of Matthew 17. A young boy has a spirit that has plagued his son. I guess a man has a, has a, um, has a boy. Um, a young... So... <laughs> I've obviously worded this sentence incorrectly. A young boy has had a spirit that has plagued him for his whole life. It's plagued him for since he was very young, you know. Tormented him from birth, even, is what it says. The demon has often thrown the boy into the fire or in water to kill him. This spirit that would afflict an entire generation from its youth is the wrestling of the principalities mentioned in Ephesians 6, that you who have been set free, you who once were under the influence of the principalities, once walking according to the flesh, once an alien and estranged from God, an enemy of God even in Ephesians 2, you who are once walking according to the principalities and powers of the air, but have now been brought into the commonwealth of Israel, you've now been redeemed of grace through faith, not of works that you might boast. The whole point of Ephesians chapter 2, you were once in the kingdom of darkness, but you're no longer there. To you, this charge is given in, in chapter 3, that you should be the one to, to demonstrate the manifest wisdom of God. This is verse 10, Ephesians 3.10. When you read it, what's it say? To demonstrate the manifest wisdom of God 
to the principalities and powers, not to the world, not to the Jew, not to your friends, not to the secular society around you, but to the principalities and powers. Why? Because there's a spirit. There is a veil over the nations and over, more specifically, Israel, the nation that is to be God's nation. There's a veil. There are principalities and powers over a generation that is called to be God's people and that a, this spirit has afflicted and tormented them from birth to, to wrestle the principalities and powers, as it's mentioned in Ephesians 6, is to wrestle that, to say that this boy who's been tormented since birth shall be set free because of a testimony of a people who were once prideful, who were once part of the kingdom of darkness, but their strength and their power has been broken, and they've been set free, and they've been brought into fullness. That's the whole sweep of it. As it's been done unto us, we do unto them. As it's been done to them at the end of the age, they do to everyone. That all the nations would come up to Jerusalem, because this nation the one that rules from Jerusalem, there has been something that has happened to them and all the nations see it. And so it says in, Isaiah, in uh, Zechariah 8.23 that even Gentiles shall take the skirt of a Jew and say, take us to your God for you know him because something's happened to you. I see it. If we do not as the church have an intimate relationship with the Father to know His heart, we cannot cast that demon out for the sake of the sons of freedom. We cannot cast out the demon because we cannot understand this demon plagues them as a demon that's been given by God. This is a blindness that God has given. How are we supposed to pray against God? And it's not that I would say we pray against God but that we understand his heart, that the judgment is not a matter of their sin demands justice, but he looks for them to turn to him. And so we can wrestle because we understand though they are currently under this, they shall not always be under this. And we can travail with Zion, giving him no rest till Zion be a praise in the earth, till Jerusalem be made a praise in the earth. We can give God no rest because we know His heart. That's intercession. And that's the testimony that our strength and our power has been broken, that we're no longer trusting in it. And because we no longer trust in it, we trust in Him. Isaiah 23, 9, I'll leave you with this. The Lord Almighty planned it to bring low the pride of all glory and to humble all who are renowned on the earth. The whole purpose of the end times is that the pride of you and I who have come into the new covenant, who, who should have experienced this, our pride would be broken. And our pride is broken so that their pride might be broken. And their pride will be broken so that the nation's pride will be broken. So that in the end, God will bring low the pride of all glory, all who glory, all who are renowned in the earth. Do you see what's going on here? It's a matter of everyone, not just you and I, not just the Jew, everyone. This is a cosmic purpose of God. And it behooves us to understand God's paradigm so that we might then also be a part of of the people who God chooses to bring this to pass. Because that's what He wants. He wants you and I to enjoy that. That's what He's created us for. To be part of His purposes. That we would rule with Him. That's what He's created us for. It's what He put us in this time, in this generation for. That we would see it and understand His heart. And in our own time, in our own generation, we'd make our own choice to follow Him. Whatever that looks like for here and now, we follow Him. So I bless you in the name of Jesus, grace and peace to you, 
And may you be that person that because your power has been broken, because your strength has been broken, because your pride has been broken, you might then go and, re and release the prisoners and set freedom to the captive.